Hi everybody, and uh, thanks for attending this uh, unique event, the um, Telecom Audio PC Conference for uh, HBK. And today I'd like to be talking about um, something that is dear to my heart, fascinated me for for many many years, and finally I have I had the good excuse to dig out some some of our test equipment and and go and try and get to the bottom of that. Uh, you know, the, the question that's been bugging me for so long, which is, why do so many of us like the sound of vinyl? Um, and I've heard that the measurements look bad, so why not try and make some measurements of my own and uh, investigate? And I'd like to warn you that um, this is a work in progress. I'd like to think that once this uh, conference is over, I'd find time to dig in again and try and find answers to some of the questions that that arose during during uh, during this session. So I'd like to take this moment here to uh, quickly run through uh, the content uh, I'll be presenting today, um, and we'll start off with uh, with an introduction. Um, we're going to look at the background to why I decided I, I wanted to. I, almost I needed to make uh, these measurements. Um, we'll take a little look at the audio equipment uh, that was tested. Um, I'll review the test equipment used. Uh, I will review uh, the test methods that I decided to use. We will look at some results and hopefully form some conclusions. Having been through one to seven, I decided at the last minute it was necessary to do an epilogue post-mortem because some things weren't really making sense. So here we go with the introduction. Uh, I think like so many of us who ended up making careers out of, of acoustics, um, many of us I think came in through music. Um, many of my colleagues, um, both in the U.S. and all over the world at, at B&K, either you know had a musical education or just liked listening to music. And, and actually, many of us um, play music. Well, I've always been playing, and, and this is a, a picture of me. And I'm probably four or five, and that's my mum, and that's uh, Liverpool in in 1965 and I'm getting my first guitar and I'm clearly not in love with the idea. Um, I think my facial expression says, I have no interest in this, take it back. Anyway, skip forward to 2019 and this is a picture of my band playing a, a nice concert we did down in San Pedro. And as I was saying, every member of this band I'm in, they, uh, their day jobs, they are all acoustic consultants. Um, some of the faces might be familiar to you. So I basically spent 40 years measuring sound. Um, this was my test rig at uh, the Institute of Sound and Vibration Research where, where I went to university. And a, a quick little uh, anecdote here. Uh, I was in a band uh, in Liverpool in, the, in the, the height of the punk rock movement in 1979. I had absolutely no interest in going to music, uh, going to university. My uh, my mind was set on be becoming a musician. Um, we we were terrible. We didn't stand a chance. But you know, you're 18 and you get crazy ideas. So I thought I'm going to be a musician. So my dad finally said to me, "Hey, yes, I know you're going to be famous, but in the meantime, take a look at this book of um, university courses and tell me which one um, you, you you'll apply for. At least you can apply even if you don't end up going." So I opened up the book and the, the course was beginning with A and the first one was accounting. And I thought, I don't really see myself as an accountant. Um, next to accounting was acoustics. And I said, okay, I'll tick that box. And that's really where it all began. It took about two minutes of, uh, of, of analysis in my head. And shortly after I made the application to the ISVR, um, the band fell apart and I ended up being uh, an undergraduate at the ISVR. After graduation, I 
moved to London and I became a loudspeaker um, test engineer uh, for a company called um, Electroacoustic Industries, otherwise known as ELAC. And I was there between 83 and 85. Um, then in 85, I got a phone call from B&K and they were looking for technical writers to join them in their factory in Denmark. So off I went to Denmark and I started off as a technical writer. One of the first articles I ended up writing was about how you use a two-channel FFT analyzer, analyzer to uh, measure loudspeaker performance. And I've been at B&K ever since. Various roles, various places all around the world and it's been such a lot of fun. So I think like many of you, um, when the pandemic uh, came along, um, I was found myself wanting to do some projects that I wanted to do for a long, long time, just didn't have the time. And I suddenly found myself being at home all the time with the opportunity to like do some projects. And so one of the first projects I I'd wanted to do was to dig out this turntable. Uh, I had and I bought it back in 88 and it didn't have a pickup cartridge anymore so I bought myself a pickup cartridge and I bought myself a, a preamp and friends would come over um, socially distanced wearing masks of course and uh, everyone would suddenly comment on how they how how much they really love the sound of listening to r r vinyl records uh, with this setup um, which um, I, I I agreed with them. I said, yeah, it does sound good. Uh, so out of curiosity, I decided to informally uh, blind test uh, 14 friends over the space of three months, um, playing the exact same source material, the same track, and figuring out a way to play it via CD, MP3, streaming, and vinyl without including the uh, the running track on the vinyl because obviously that would be a clue as to oh that must be the vinyl so i basically faded up the vinyl you know somewhere like one minute into the track so that they wouldn't know it was the vinyl apart from the crackling and the popping um and, and you know it's pretty pretty clear actually which is the vinyl but surely people wouldn't want to hear the crackling and the popping and 12 out of 14 people who, who took the test said they preferred the analog recording I had on vinyl uh, to the other, the other um, ways that I presented the music. But then the question, of course, is how can the hard, one of the hardest substances on Earth, i.e. a diamond, rubbing against one of the softest substances, vinyl how can that possibly sound anywhere near as good as the perfect performance of a digitally recorded digitally mixed digitally mastered digitally delivered to your speaker how is that on earth possible so just a quick word as to what uh, the source material was that i presented to my um my friends my my jury if you like um, a vinyl record um, from a, a musicians called Richard and Linda Thompson. The track uh, Don't Renege on, Renege on Our Love was uh, recorded on the album in 82, live to tape, analog mixed, analog mastered, printed to vinyl. And the copy that I have uh, was purchased that year, um, 38 years ago. It's well played, cracked, warped. And the two digital formats, the CD and what is up on, uh, on Spotify, um, I think they're digitally remastered. Um, I don't know too much about them. So what did people say? And this is why we, I think we've, I have, um, and I know uh, others have done much more scientific, a uh, much more scientific approach to this, of uh, you know marrying um, physic physical data, uh, measurement data to subjective response. It's a very fascinating relationship to consider uh, physics and psychology interacting. But this is what some of the people said when they listened to the record, and when I I had them write down anonymously 
um, what what they thought, why they thought it was better. And I got responses, of course, like it's less harsh, it's less brash, it's smoother, it's more realistic, it has a better image. Someone said it's like the band is in the room and um, more musical, more solid. And my, fa my favorite one was, um, you know, you shouldn't, it's hard to ask humans to subjectively evaluate uh, audio response, but my favorite response was, um, don't ask me, it just is. So let's have a look at some of the, uh, the uh, audio equipment th that I got to test. So the old uh, Thorens 321 I mentioned earlier, I think it's a Ger German or Swiss turntable. Uh, a Rega pickup arm, I think that's from the UK. Um, there's the turntable. And then the Autophon, brand new Autophon pickup cartridge and the Bellari, um, the Bellari preamp with the RIA filtering. And I, you know, and I know this is con controversial, but I really love the fact that uh, Bellari put um, uh, t tone controls you don't see tone controls on high end or hi fi. The, the I think the theory being, you just shouldn't do that. It's it's sacrilege to apply uh, your desired EQ to the music. It should just be exactly as it was recorded. Well, the problem with that theory is, you know, as you get most of us get, you know, past 20, 30, 40, 50 years of age, our hearing is not as good as it used to be, and it's nice to be able to compensate for that with a little bit of treble. But for the testing, I made sure that the, the equalization was, was in the neutral position. So take a look at the, uh, the speakers that uh, people were listening to when they did, when they did the testing, when the, the, blind, the blind test. And I apologize for the quality of the photographs. The, uh, the one on the left is the uh, von uh, the right is the von Schweikert uh, front speakers. Um, they're from Riverside, California. Von Schweikert subwoofer and an ATI six channel, 1800 watt multi-room amplifier, two channels used for the purposes of this testing. And now let's take a look at the uh, dig digital equipment that was used. Um, the um, Pile Audio, I mean, this thing was incredibly inexpensive. I, I don't remember, it was much less than $100. It's got everything built in. It's even got built in karaoke machine if, if that's what you want, um, but it, you know you can play all sorts of different sources. But the reason I I use it is because when on our patio at home, it's nice to use Bluetooth, and this is typically outside connected to some speakers on the patio. Uh, but I'm using it here as the Bluetooth receiver with the analog output, which I can analyze. And the digital um, other digital component is the NAD CD player, uh, NAD 5000 I bought in '96. So I want to talk about the relative cost of this audio equipment, just in case some of you think that um, it only sounded so good, uh, the vinyl only sounded so good because it was really the top of the range, and that really is not the case. Uh, most audio files uh, would consider the retro gear, the turntable, the arm, um, to be at the very much at the lower end of the audio file barometer, even if it registered on an audio file barometer, it's really pretty low-end stuff and cost-wise the newer equipment the cartridge the preamp the bluetooth receiver probably cost less than 500 dollars combined uh, the speaker system however that i used um cost probably would cost about ten thousand dollars today with the amplifiers uh, but bear in mind that the same speaker system was used for listening to the uh, bluetooth and listening to the cd player so that's kind of a common factor through, so therefore not an influence on the testing. Uh, the Torrance turntable, uh, I think I paid $300 for it back in 88. And the NAD, um, I think it cost $250 um, back in 96. And the Riga arm about 200. The bottom line though, once again, this is not an audio file, top of the range setup, apart from the speakers. And the amplifiers. So let's took, uh, take a look at the uh, the test gear used, and this was the very first um, time I'd ever owned. I had to go and buy it. Actually, it's a, a it's a test record. 
uh, from Autophon. And that's a coincidence that I was also using an Autophon cartridge. I bought this um, on Amazon. It was about $40, brand new. And on it, there are uh, many tests, um, but the ones I were using were the frequency sweeps. And curious to see that the record is claiming 800 to 50 kilohertz uh, sweeping in a, uh, in a log manner, 28 seconds. And um, I didn't like that. I wish I'd known. I wish I could go below 800 hertz. Now let's take a look at the, uh, the, the test equipment I used to um, measure on the test record. So I used the BNK Lanx I module, uh, which had four inputs and two outputs connected to a PC. Uh, this module was sampling at 133,000 samples per second on each channel. Looks like that. And the main software I used for analysis was the uh, BK Connect software. So some of you probably haven't used the, the BK Connect software, certainly for, uh, uh, you know, electroacoustic type testing, although it's it's pretty well known in the general sound uh, analysis, uh, acoustic analysis community. I'll just quickly run through the uh, the main parts of the software. So on the left of the screen over here, this is where all my uh, data lives, um, my measurements, my recordings, uh, data I've, recordings I've made with the, this module or recordings I've made uh, somewhere else and everything just lives in this, in this project tree over here. When I've connected my Lanx I hardware to the system, to, to the computer, my module pops up here, and this has shown my two generator outputs and my four inputs, and the two on the top are green because they're active, and they are the left and the right measuring a setup to measure voltage at one volt per volt. Uh, when I have a recording, um, it will appear in the time domain here, and I can um, select a portion of the recording or this one track that's in this case the right channel only and run that section through an analysis what we call a process chain that where we define exactly how we want to analyze that signal uh, I manage all my displays using this uh, very simple um, uh, what we call a result matrix here and then I get my results over here So let's take a look now at uh, some of the other test gear that I ended up using uh, out, out of convenience more than more than anything. Uh, I ended up using uh, the B&K uh, 2270 handheld uh, simply as a as a wave file recorder with with you know in uh, laboratory standard measurements in your hand recording to an SD card. And when it came to you know, if you want to just grab something, go and take a measurement, maybe the speakers in somebody's studio, a recording studio or in a concert hall, you want to just put some, throw something in your bag, you want it to be really quick. Uh, you'd probably use something like this because it's going to record um, wave files, uh, engineering units uh, on the wave files straight to an SD card. And you can then analyze those uh, any way you like later, for example, with the BK Connect software. At some point during the project here, I also needed to uh, run multiple uh, multiple inputs into uh, a recorder, and I didn't have access to my laptop um, for various reasons. And one of which was uh, we have we have builders in at the house right now, and uh, I didn't have access to um, my office, so. I ended up using the um, there's a version of Lanx I which doesn't need a PC and records all its channels straight to a WAV file uh, on an SD card without a PC. And I just basically pointed a browser to the, to the module and said, um, you know, left channel, right channel, one volt per volt, go and record some data. So now I'd like to talk about the analysis uh, itself and what, uh, what techniques uh, I use for the project. Um, I like the uh, the color maps that you get from uh, FFT versus time. Uh, for me, they tell uh, a loud and clear story as to uh, distortion. Um, I, I might personally have a problem looking at the, the classical 
ways of looking at distortion with the fundamental and then the you know the second and third harmonics down below they don't speak to me when i look at a color map uh, i can see um i just get a better feeling for wow that's bad or that's good and also the other analysis that we use to get the actual response curve is a 124th octave spectra in this little unit here we call it cpb constant percentage bandwidth it's just a, a fractional octave analyzer uh, the signals I recorded will flow through the FFT versus time and the 24th octave simultaneously with the uh, the, uh, the 24th octave analyzer running between 800 and 25 kilohertz, a quarter of a second exponential averaging with a maximum hold on individual bands in that 24th octave spectrum. So the very first thing that uh, we needed to do here was to replicate uh, digitally a, a sign sweep like that which was on the record. And to do that, we uh, I had to actually go back to our software called Pulse Lab Shop and um, ask it to generate a swept sign uh, between 800 and 20 kilohertz, just like on the record, um, make it log, and sweep to get to 20 to do that sweep in 28 seconds required um, 70 milli decades per second. So this generated uh, what what uh, a what we call a uh, a PTI file, which is the internal format that um, BK Connect could import directly. So. I took, uh, we got the sign sweep generated. It's inside of BK Connect. Uh, let's take a look at what that looks like when it flows through that process chain that we just described. And wow, that's the rule of flat, as you would imagine, imagine it would be. Um, this is the sweep of FFT versus time, 28 seconds. And as you see, look at that display range, the 80 dB uh, display range. Um, there are no distortion components. And um, that's what we're going to be comparing everything to in the, in the perfect world. Everything, every transducer we use, like a pickup, every CD player, every, every way we, we want to reproduce this sign sweep, we're going to be comparing to that. So now we're going to talk about how we actually test the vinyl. Um, so as we saw earlier, the Autophon test record um, claimed to have a log sweep 800 hertz to 20 kilohertz plus or minus 1.5 lasting 28 seconds um, that's all we had i wish uh, it it, be, it began uh, at a lower frequency than 800 but um, beggars cannot be choosers i remember back in the um, in the in the 80s uh, b and k was making a, a vinyl test record uh, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz so I, I'm going to talk to Autophon. Um, there must be a good reason that they limit that to 800 hertz, but I, I didn't have time to have that conversation with them uh, before uh, the deadline for for this for this paper here. Um, so the output of the Bellari uh, preamplifier, which contained these RIAA filters, uh, was measured directly as a voltage from the RCA output into the Lanx I module on both channels left and right and recordings and analysis were made of that sign sweep. Uh, RIAA, by the way, stands for the Recording Industry Association of America. Here's the measurement chain. The record on the turntable into, let me pick up the, the record on the turntable, turntable cartridge to the preamp, preamp out into Lanx I, Lanx I recording into BK Connect software. So this is the point where if I had a drum uh, to roll, there would be a drum roll because now we're gonna look at the frequency response uh, and distortion of the system the record player system that we've just been listening to or trying to describe are you ready that looks terrible frequency response dropping off 
um, there's minus uh, minus 18 dB. It's already dropping off um, uh, to a 3 dB by 4 kilohertz, and it just keeps going down. And you, that's also reflected in this is the actual sweep itself in the time in the time domain. And the very first thought that came to mind is maybe Audifon left off RIAA filtering on the test record. So if that was the case, we would see that big uh, that big roll off in, of the high frequency uh, because the RAA filter is doing its job, but it's doing its job on a, on a record that didn't have it applied in the first place. That was my very first uh, my very first thought. So yeah, look at that um, the time domain dropping off, the frequency response already declining at 2k, uh, around about uh, 3 dB per octave. Pretty pretty uh, bad. You would not imagine uh, a system like that could possibly sound good at all. So I'm not 100% convinced that uh, millennials or uh, even people uh, older than that have ever even heard of RIA filtering. So let's just uh, describe what that what that was and is even today. So back in the day, in order to get as much music on a record as possible, you had to limit the swing of the stylus, the excursion left to right. It had to be limited so you could have narrower grooves and get more, more music on a record. So a filter was applied to the uh, to the cutting tool essentially, or the or the or the music that was feeding the, the cutting tool, uh, with big 20 dB attenuation of the bass, uh, no attenuation and no gain uh, at one kilohertz, and rising uh, 20 dB to 20 kilohertz. So the blue curve is what was applied during the the cutting process, and the red curve is what is inside the preamp. To, to bring back the bass that was cut off and reduce the, uh, the high frequency that was, um, that was applied. And if you think of it, that's a little bit like the Dolby uh, noise reduction um, way of that like you, you boost everything earlier on, you cut it back later. So that's what the RIA filtering uh, shape is. Uh, that sh the blue curve should have been applied to the Autophon record. It didn't appear to have done so. Hence the, the fact that the red line then almost replicates the, the dropping off of, of my measurement. So I took a quick look at the, uh, the data sheet for the uh, Bellari uh, preamp I was using, just to be sure that I was understanding this correct. And there you have it. It describes that the, what the RIA equalization curve is doing, why it's doing it, in other words, to put um, put back the base and eliminate the, the, the treble boost, which in itself also helps to eliminate the crackles and the, and the hiss, everything you get on a record. Just like, as I said, just like a little bit like the Dolby noise reduction principle. Um, and the claim, claim frequency response of this unit is uh, 3 hertz to uh, 30, 36 kilohertz. Let me just uh, highlight that for you. 3 hertz to 36 kilohertz. Pretty good. So it seems that the uh, the Bellari uh, is doing its job according to the specification. So let's go and see what the test record has to say. Um, and there you have it. The test record is designed to be played through your system with built-in RIA equalization. So these tracks, by assumption, uh, I would have to conclude that every track, every test track, has the RIAA filter as associated with it. So perhaps my frequency response uh, is actually as bad as it as it looked. So now we're going to take a look at the uh, vinyl distortion, and you know, in the in the media and the hi-fi um, media over the over the years, it's often um, talked about that the, the way, for example, tube amplifiers, tube preamplifiers, they distort, gives it the sound. Uh, and maybe uh, the sound of vinyl is, is caused by uh, distortion components. But I mean, as you see, uh, there is rich content here of distortion. 
uh, from from the record um, from the record player system. What's also kind of interesting here is has, has 20 kilohertz um, right here. Look how much energy is happening above above 20k, particularly how much distortion energy is happening above 20k. Is that a possible uh, contributor to the uh, the sound of vinyl that we um, like printed in us? Um, maybe we we like that. Uh, maybe there's some psychology happening that um, we are, are the physics of our hearing is detecting uh, these patterns and it, it, it just sounds nice to us. Um, I'm just speculating right now. Let's, um, let's take a look at our left right crosstalk. Um, what does that mean um, um, in, in terms of what we're, what we're trying to measure here? So what I did was uh, hit, uh, if you look at the uh, the sweeps here, so left channel, uh, left channel, right channel. So you see here the left channel is on, then the right channel is on, then the left channel is on, and the right channel is on. Uh, so I'm only analyzing this this one here, which is the right channel, which is in this display over here. So here's the um, the right channel being on, and the right channel being off with the left channel playing. Well. As the left channel is playing, you're still measuring it on the um, on the right channel, and then the left channel comes back on, the left channel goes off, and uh, the right channel is basically still coming through. Um, not as loud, obviously, if you can see that here, but left is present in the right, and right is pl uh, present in the left. That's called a, cr a crosstalk, and you would imagine that would uh, be something you wouldn't want to have. So as I mentioned earlier, I actually did uh, do a uh, in-room measurement in my office of the sign sweep from the record going through a loudspeaker at um, about 90 dB uh, level uh, in a room, one meter, with a, with a handheld uh, 2270 analyzer. And you know you can see that the, it's not obviously as smooth anymore because we've got lots of uh, room reflections and, and so on and so forth. The contribution that also superimposed here of the loudspeaker frequency response. Um, so all in all, um, not very pretty, but you can still see the same trend, uh, just a little a little spikier than 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 it was. As I, as I, so one of the final measurements that we're going to take on the um, on the turntable system is um, the uh, the left right tracking. So the uh, red curve is to the left channel and the blue curve is the right channel. And you will see that they, uh, there's more gain, there's more output on the, um, on the right channel than the left channel. That's not very good. Uh, that could just be a simple indicator that uh, I have bias uh, all set up, uh, anti-skating maybe set up wrong on my turntable. I mean, this is one of the challenges, uh, one of the beauties of digital electronics is that you really don't have to worry too much about those things. But when you have a turntable, uh, you really, you've got to set it up right. And that, that is a lot more difficult than it sounds. But, but this one clearly isn't set up right with bad tracking left to right. So enough of these measurements on, uh, in the analog domain and turntables. Let's go digital. Uh, let's come let's take the holy grail signal we started with uh, the digital one and convert it to an mp3 uh, send it up to uh, the cloud and send it from my phone to a bluetooth receiver and measure at the output of that bluetooth receiver so the holy grail converted to a low res mp3 uh, to do that i used um, i used a sonar digital audio workstation uh, I uploaded that to SoundCloud, I broadcast that MP3 via Bluetooth, and I measured at the line out of the Bluetooth receiver. Uh, drum roll, please. Well, that looks significantly better than my turntable. I think I will just, uh, I'll just leave it there. So we just saw that the uh, the frequency response of, uh, of the downgraded signal via Bluetooth um, was pretty rule of straight um, 
Now, what? Let's take a look at the distortion within that, uh, within that, within that chain. And obviously, not as clear. Um, there's all sorts of like close energy, uh, close in frequency energy around the fundamental. There's, there are some. Uh, I mean, all this sort of stuff to above and below. It's not very clean, but it's not certainly. It's much cleaner than the than the vinyl. And I'm getting some spurious uh, uh, effects, uh, whether this is due to the uh, the analog amplifier it ended up having to go through. Remember, it was a low cost. Um, is this the Kodak introducing some of these uh, effects? I really don't know, but I mean, I can live with that. That that looks that looks pretty good. So, uh, CD players, who remembers those things? They came, uh, they hung around a while, uh, they threatened to uh, revolutionize uh, the way we uh, um, enjoyed our music, and now they're practically disappearing if they haven't already disappeared. Um, which, um, you know, I have one, and let's, let's, uh, let's check out its performance before they all disappear, and then we won't be able to actually um, measure this one ever. So. What we did was to take the Holy Grail signal and uh, convert it to a 16-bit 44.1K um, wave file uh, using BK Connect. We added that wave file to iTunes. Uh, I burned a CD from iTunes and I measured at the line out of the of the NAD 5000 CD player. Uh, drum roll, please. That is very very nice wouldn't you agree significantly better than my turntable so let's take a look once again uh, as we've been doing frequency response then we're going to look at distortion um, when uh, after this has been sent uh, and made into a cd measured at the cd output pretty clean um, significantly uh, nicer than the mp3 um, and significantly nicer um, than the turntable so uh, some some conclusions um, typically after a conference uh, at a conference or in a conference paper there's a conclusion that's pretty black and white and uh, typically the author will in a project like this will state um, that more research uh, still needs to be done. Uh, that is absolutely the case here. More research, more measurements need to be done um, because more questions have been raised than have been answered. Um, the frequency response uh, clearly is not a good indicator of, of, of listener preference. Um, distortion and compression uh, artifacts of the digital uh, process, the sampling, um, are we losing anything when we when we sample a continuous uh, musical uh, performance? Um, I think those arguments are going to go on and on for for many many years. I need to do some further measurements. I have to talk to Audifon about the RIA filtering on the vinyl. Maybe it wasn't on the record. Um, I'm disappointed that the test record didn't have signals below 800 hertz. That's my fault. I should have checked. I just assumed it would, uh, having owned the B&K test record from the 80s, which uh, started at 20 hertz. And, but the, and of course, the blind test was biased. Um, all the participants who took place were over 40. Um, if that if people in the room had been in their 20s, maybe. They're just used to a different way that things sound now. Maybe uh, older people uh, have that vinyl sound ingrained uh, in, in inside of them, and anything not sounding like that doesn't sound as good. It once again, it's uh, physics meets uh, psychology, and anything can happen when those two things collide. But one thing's for sure is that the uh, the argument as to which sounds better, analog or vinyl. Um, analog recordings on vinyl records to be quite precise there's no real reason to put a digital recording on a, on a vinyl although you see quite a lot of that these days um, analog recordings put on vinyl records 
uh, that argument as to which sound better will rage on for a long, long time. So just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water and the presentation was over, after having completed the presentation, I was so troubled by the response I was measuring on the turntable that I thought I would just measure the, uh, the output of the, um, the, the cartridge system without the preamp to see what that would look like. Um, so what I did basically was to take the, um, the standalone recorder and in this, which is, which is right here, and directly connect the cartridge output bypassing the preamp straight into Lanxi. And this is where we need uh, an even bigger drum roll than we've been having so far. Right, look at that. The red curve is the response we've been looking at previously, which is the response of the, of the pickup uh, through the preamp. The blue is the direct output of the, of, the, of the pickup. So question, is that red curve the real response? And is the blue curve, because we have a big, um, a big impedance mismatch here between the few hundred ohms at the output of the, of the cartridge uh, into the, um, I think, 100 mega ohms uh, of the Lanxi module this looks like a resonant, a typical resonant system you'd find uh, from any dynamic system with, um, you know, a moving, moving magnet um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a coil. Um, so I don't know. This certainly this measurement here didn't help me throw any more light on um, what I'd been finding. However, it just makes me want to carry on and make some more measurements and uh, hopefully get back to you all in the future sometime uh, with, with some more solid uh, conclusions. Thanks for your attention. Bye-bye.